Welcome back to Moose on the Loose. My name's David and today's top stories, we've got the carbon tax as we loom towards that April 1st deadline where the carbon tax goes up 23%. Things are going to go nutty and we've got Jordan Peterson with the best take you'll ever hear on the carbon tax on climate change. Talking about Canada, it is something to see. It is really something everyone should see. So we'll break that down. We've also got a clip here from uh, Larry Brock. Absolutely obliterating one of these corrupt guys involved in the rive scam uh, as well as a few other things so let's jump into this first off we've got a facebook group that was sent to me this is a if you look here this is one of the examples nationwide protest against the carbon tax this group is gaining 5,000 people per day it is crazy so uh what you want to do here is i'll link this up it's nationwide protest against the carbon tax.ca and if you go to communities it has all the links here uh, you got nationwide and then all the different provinces. And the goal here is a lot of people are talking about taking out some cash before April 1st. So people want to go uh, without you using credit cards. They want to make the credit card companies feel that pain, just going back to a cashless society. But more importantly, filling up your car and not buying any gas for a week. Uh, that's what people are talking about here. So on top of that, there is going to be this nationwide uh, protest. So join your local group, check it out. Um, yeah, and so let's move on to the next clip here. We've got, so now we've got Jordan Peterson. He's uh, doing this um, debate with uh, this at Destiny guy. This is Destiny, Jordan Peterson. Uh, let's see what they have to say here about uh, climate change. It's, it's, I think this is a complete bloody travesty, by sure. the way. We are putting the lives of hundreds of millions of people uh -huh. directly at risk right now to hypothetically save people in the future, depending on the accuracy of our projections. A hundred years out, in these, these interventionists, these people who are remediating externalities, they actually believe that they can calculate an economic projection one century out. That's utterly delusional. That is utterly delusional if we think about that. Just think of how far we've come in just the last couple of years where now every every day I'm using AI for different things, whether it's ChatGPT or whatever, looking up things. I use this app, uh, this website called HeyPi. It's H-E-Y-P-I dot com, HeyPi. You can talk to this thing and say, hey, can you give me some ideas on blah, blah, blah? And it just spits them out and it's great. It is excellent. You can keep, it's conversational. And just the fact that we're advancing so fast, there's no way the people in the past could have predicted where we're going in the future. And that's what Trudeau and the liberals and, you know, the, the, the woke left think they can do. They cannot. So, okay. So just as a, to be clear, the first thing, I was just giving an example of how you can use like a government intervention to make a free market track something, which, which is yeah. what cap and trade or like carbon taxes would do. Um, I wasn't necessarily speaking to the strength of that individual thing, but yeah, but that's a good that, thing to focus on. Sure, yeah, we can focus on that as well. Yeah. We can focus on that as well. So, um, the first thing, uh, this is going to sound mean, uh, but I'm, you know, I'm very realistic. Uh, there needs to be a better argument than just it disproportionately impacts the poor. That's, That's not always a classic leftist argument. Sure, it might be, a, but, uh, right, but it's the same argument you made to justify your swing to the left at the beginning of our discussion. You said that you were looking at economic inequalities that disproportionately affected the poor. So uh -huh. I can't see why. And I'm, I'm not trying to be mean about this no, either. I, I, I can't see why you could base your argument that it was moral it was morally appropriate for you to swing to the left from your previous position because you saw disproportionate effects on the poor. And I can't use that argument in the situation that I'm presenting it right now. Well, because it depends on if we think it's a condition that ought to be remedied or not. For instance, if I walk you know, around and I see homeless people and I'm like, man, this is really sad. We ought to spend more home money on homeless people because it seems like they're disproportionately affected by their living conditions. And then somebody says, oh, well, do you think we should still lock up you know, rapists and murderers? Aren't they disproportionately poor? I'd probably say, well, yeah, we probably should. And I go, well, isn't that hypocritical? Well, no, I think that rapists and murderers should probably be in jail, but we can also help the homeless at the same time. I think that just helping the poor isn't an argument, a, 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 like a blank check to do every possible thing to satisfy poorer people. Right, uh, It's going to depend on, uh, from issue yeah, to issue. Yeah, that's fine. So, like, for instance, that's I think- because the poor, mm -hmm. everyone who's poor is not a victim. Some people who are poor are psychopathic perpetrators, sure. and it's very useful to distinguish them. But I was making a much more specific argument. My argument was that the fastest way out of absolute privation for the world's bottom billion people is through cheap energy. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying there. So I just work so, my way towards that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just want to say that just because something targets the poor is not necessarily an argument against it. Uh, another it depends on how hard it targets them, and it depends on whether it, mass starvation is the outcome. The outcome is important. That I agree with. So, for instance, like a sin tax. The, the, tax ma is on the like, outcome will be mass starvation. Yeah, I'm getting to it. Okay. Yeah, I'm getting to it. Okay. Sin tax. 
So we talk about that for a second. There's an article that came out, I think, at the end of December. It was a study. It was one of the largest studies. We've got it here. So what Jordan Peterson's talking about the starvation is essentially, I mean, it's happening in Canada, but it's also happening in, in places like Africa where they want cheap energy. They want what they, we have in the West and in, in Canada and in, in the United States, Europe, etc. Basically, the woke left is saying, no, 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 we don't want you, you know, putting out uh, all the, that carbon as well. You guys have to stay poor. You, you, we don't want you using the fossil fuels. You have to just go green. Meanwhile, you got the woke left telling all of the citizens like us that we're the problem. But this study here, you can see it, uh, it says the richest 1% account for more carbon emissions than the poorest 66%. <laughs> so we can see where the real problem is here. It adds, the most comprehensive study of global climate inequality ever undertaken shows that this elite group made up of 77 million people, people including billionaires, millionaires, and those paid more than 140,000 US dollars, was that about $180,000 Canadian a year, accounted for 16% of all CO2 emissions in 2019, enough to cause more than a million excess deaths due to heat. This, <laughs> this study, Trudeau is the problem. <laughs> That, you know, Taylor Swift, you know, Swifties don't hate me, but it's like, if you got these, these mega wealthy people flying around their jets, they're the problem. You know, this, this was actually pointed out to uh, Bill Gates and he said, oh, I just paid $9 million a year to offset it. Like $9 million to Bill Gates is absolutely nothing. Let's get real. To him, this, this, this can of drink here is probably... That is equivalent of $9 million to him, his net worth, like realistically. The fact that they want to use this against us is absolutely ridiculous. Well, the argument would be that whatever pain and suffering poor people might endure right now because of a move towards green energy, that pain and suffering is going to be short term and far less than the long term pain and suffering. Right, but that's that dependent with... on the integrity of the economic models and the and, and, the, and the climate models as well, right? right. Exactly. Course, but yeah. that but is in exactly mm -hmm. the stacked manner that I described. And like there's nobody in 1890 who could have predicted what was going to happen in 1990 economically. Uh -huh. Not not a bit, not a bit. And and if we think we can predict like 50 years out now with the current rate of technology and calculate the potential impact of climate change on economic flourishing for human beings, we're deluded. No one can do that. And then, mm -hmm. and so, and it, it's worse. So imagine that as you do that and you project outward, your margin of error increases. That's absolutely, definitely the case. And at some point you're certainly on the climate side, the margin of error gets rapidly to the point where it subsumes any estimate of the degree to which the climate is going to transform and that happens even more rapidly on the economic side potentially so, but right now i think right now this is a disagreement on the fact of the matter though not the philosophy of what we're talking about in terms of controlling externalities if we think i'm so i'm curious let's say that we think we can accurately predict the climate and the economic impact and we think that the climate impact would be far worse if we don't account for that both in terms of yeah, human conditions and- I don't believe and, any of those presumptions. I sure, think but, then, but then if you don't, but I mean, like, obviously if I agreed with the, that factual analysis, I would probably agree with you on the prescription here too, right? And well, I don't- Like none of the climate models were accurate or couldn't accurately predict anything, they're not I'd also say why they- Well, they're not sufficiently accurate. That's the first thing. And sure. sec, because they have a margin of error and it's a large margin of error, they don't even model cloud coverage well. That's a big problem. They don't have the resolution. They don't have nearly the resolution to produce the accuracy that's claimed by the climate apocalypse mongers. People Not keep saying- Yeah, on that, let's just look at a, a, a post here on Twitter. In regards to what Jordan Peterson just said there, we don't have the data. Well, look who posted here today, Justin Trudeau, just two hours ago. You can see here, the Canada carbon rebate puts hundreds of dollars back in Canadians' pockets every quarter. Oddly, <laughs> some premiers are against that. And they want to scrap your rebates. Here's what we had to say about that. Now, this is just absolute vitriol filth, but dear premiers, thank you for raising the issue of Canada's carbon pricing system. Our government is acutely aware of the increasing financial pressure facing Canadians. We know that they want us to help make life more affordable. That is exactly why we designed the federal carbon pricing backstop to be revenue neutral. It's the same garbage they keep pushing in the House of Commons. Every single press conference It's a bunch of lies, a bunch of lying losers. You don't have a backbone and they don't do right by Canadians. A parliamentary budget officer, can, yeah, 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 blah, blah, blah. It's all the same crap. Eight out of 10 families, now it's wrong, wrong, wrong. But wh what's important to note here is if you go through this filth, our government knows that Canadians care about fighting climate change. The devastating effects of floods, wildfires, and droughts are escalating costs annually, destroying homes, ravaging communities, inflating the prices of food. <laughs> 
and consumer goods. You sure that's not has nothing to do with Caitlin Weston? Uh, why is food cheap at Dollarama? And you know what? There's some small food shops popping up in different places, different cities, and their food is much cheaper. Hmm. I wonder why that is. Wildfires. BC has 70% of wildfires started by people. Alberta at 66% started by people. Human caused. It's not climate change. We have roughly the same amount of lightning strike fires in those two regions where it gets a lot of wildfires every year. Now we're getting big wildfires, but it's because we have dingbats starting fires in dry, dry places. There's no doubt that we're getting warmer temperatures. We're getting these record temperatures. But like as Jordan Peterson pointed out, is that because the, the climate model is... You know, on what timeline? What timeline is that? I mean, I mean, they found tropical debris in, in like the, uh, was it Antarctica? And they drilled those core samples all the way down to the middle of Timbok nowhere. It used to, like the poles shift on the earth. Everything shifts. The climates shift. The equator shifts. It's not as simple as the liberals and the, the woke left want to make this out to be. But what's important to note here is at the bottom, it says uh, Canada's world-class carbon pricing system was designed to both make life affordable for, for people today as all, while also driving the changes needed to ensure our kids and grandkids enjoy a clean, safe, and healthy future. Our government's plan is already yielding tangible results. Oh, really? Where are the results? Somebody show me the results. <laughs> this is a lie. They're not even measuring. If you're, if you're new here, the government is not measuring anything. They're not measuring results, period. So why, why even lie in here? You can't pull the wool over our eyes, Trudeau. But we just got another one of the hottest years on record. How many times are we going to have another hottest year on record? How many times are we going to have an increase of carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere before we're finally like, okay. I don't hmm. know. And the, the reason I don't know is because it depends. The scientific answer to that question depends precisely on the time frame over which you evaluate the climate fluctuation. And that's actually an intractable scientific problem. So you might say, well, if you take the last hundred years, this variation looks pretty dismal. And I'd say, well, what if, what if you took the last 150,000 years or yeah, the last 10,000 or the last 10 million? You can't specify the damn no, no, time no, no, frame no. of That's, analysis. The, the time frame is incredibly important. That would be like saying, look at your, you know, uh, let's say somebody developed cancer and they didn't realize it. And the person has lost, you know, 40 or 50 pounds in, in the past six months. And I was like, you... You look very sickly. And you're like, okay, well, look at my weight fluctuation over the past 10 years. You say, well, that doesn't really matter. What matters is the fact that I'm not saying the, the time frame months. isn't important. Well, but I'm, I'm saying, saying that, like, that the... it is important. Yeah, I'm just no, no. saying I don't know how to specify it. Well, you would probably specify it with the beginning of the industrial age, right? Why? When, because when that's when carbon dioxide, which is a gas that's seen as trapping uh, more heat on the Why planet. Why is that relevant to, to the time over which you compute the variability? Because it seems like as carbon dioxide has increased in the atmosphere, the surface temperatures have risen at a rate that is a departure from what we'd expect over 150,000 years cycles of temperature variations on no, the planet. No, not with that time frame. That's absolutely. just not the case. It's absolutely the case. No, what do you mean? You just flipped to 150,000 year time span. What I'm so, saying is that if, if we expect to see a temperature do this in a 150,000 year time span, in a 100 year time span, seeing it do this, that's very worrying. Now, you mean it could like be the Michael case. Mann's hockey stick, the one that's under attack right now in court by a major statistician who claimed that he falsified his data. I mean, that spike? The, I'm talking about the <laughs> record temperatures that are declared that have been declared for like the past five years that have also increased with the uh, with the concentration of parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, I mean, I'm not going to tell you that every model is perfect. They're but not right perfect. now, sure. But right now, we're like standing in traffic with our eyes closed, saying the car hasn't hit me yet, so I don't think there's any coming. I think it's pretty undeniable at this point that there is an impact on climate across the planet. I, just I think that's highly deniable. We have no idea what the impact is from. We don't know where the carbon dioxide is from. We can't measure the warming of the oceans. We have terrible temperature records going back 100 years. Almost all the terrestrial temperature detection sites were first put outside urban areas. And then as and they're, right, and then you have everyone. to correct, then you have to correct for the for the movement of the urban areas. And then you introduce an error parameter that's larger than the purported increase in temperature that you're planning to measure. This isn't data, this is guess. And there's something weird underneath it. There's something weird that isn't oriented well towards human beings underneath it. It has this guise of compassion. Oh, we're gonna save the poor in the future. It's like, that's what the bloody communists said. And they killed a lot of people doing it. And we're walking down that same road now with this insistence that, you know, we're so compassionate that we care about the poor a hundred years from now. And if we have to wipe out several hundred million of them now, well, that's a small price to pay for the future utopia. And we've heard that sort of thing before. And the alternative to that is for is to stop having global level elites plot out a utopian future 
or even an anti-dystopian future. And that's exactly what's happening now with organizations like the WEF. And if this wasn't immediately impacting the poor in a devastating manner, I wouldn't care about it that much, but it is. You know, I watched over the course of the last five years, the estimates of the number of people who were in serious danger of food privation rise from about 100 million to about 350 million. That's a major price to pay for a little bit of what, what would you say for for progress on the climate front that's so narrow it can't even be measured. I don't think the increase in, in hungry people on the in the planet is because of climate policies. Why I not? Think... I mean, Jordan Peterson hits it right on the nose there. Like, there's something very sinister about what's going on here. This push to not care about the suffering of Canadians, and it's happening, you know, in America as well. It's, it's more amplified up here. The suffering of Canadians, yet... There's this push of, well, we have to do all this stuff for climate change, yet there's no talks with China. There's no talks with India. There's, <laughs> It's just, you guys have to suffer and you have to trust us. Meanwhile, Justin Trudeau is wagging his finger at us and saying, do as I say, not as I do, jumps on his plane, flies all around. He's he's part of that, that like the article I showed earlier, the richest 1% here, who's really the one that, who's to blame. That hypocrite, the high, high carbon, high flying <laughs> hypocrite is the one to blame. Him and all his cronies. You know, if we go back a couple months ago, I did a video on uh, Christia Freeland, who flies from Ottawa to Montreal. She gets her driver to drive over there, so she has her driver in Montreal, drives her around, then she flies back. What a load of crap. What kind of leader does that? That's not a leader, it's an absolute loser. And then you, you charge us a carbon tax and, and tell us to suck it up? Screw you. This carbon tax nonsense is really starting to go nuclear here and people are starting to break. That's why those Facebook groups have popped up and look out. And on a different topic now, let's jump over to Larry Brock absolutely obliterating uh, <laughs> this guy here in the Rive, the Rive Can, Rive Scam situation. Now, he basically gets this guy to admit who is responsible for the Rive Scam. There seems to be a culture of hiding information, threatening those that come forward, reprisals and a general lack of accountability from senior leadership at CBSA. This committee has bona fide concerns that CBSA's top brass is covering up and deliberately trying to hide their actions while scapegoating others. There are now over 12 investigations taking place because of this debacle. My time is limited. I'm gonna be asking for straightforward and honest responses, please. Mr. Moore, We've seen the arrive scam briefing packages that went to Ms. O'Gorman. Your name is all over these documents, as is Min Doan and Kelly Belanger. This committee has been lied to by current and former senior CBSA leadership, particularly Mr. Doan, uh, Ms. Belanger, and former president, Mr. Osaski. I expect you to tell us the truth today. Will you agree to that, sir? Thank you for the question. I hope that everyone tells the truth and answers your questions to the best of their ability. Thank I you. I will certainly do that. Thank you. So the biggest question that we need to put a final point on without deliberating any further. Here it comes. Is who at CBSA was responsible for the decision to choose GC strategies, also known as Government of Canada strategies? <laughs> We've had evidence from Cameron McDonald on two occasions confirming that. Mr. Antonio Utano confirming that it was Mindone. We also have what was really telling is a public document, an ATIP response from CBSA, which confirms in Annex A of the document that, and I'm going to read this out. Who made the decision to contract GC? My office. This is in reference to Mindone's office and Kelly Boulanger's office. Same office. My office made the decision to pursue the contract with GC Strategies. The two proposals for the work were presented to the CIO and President, and the decision was made to proceed with GC Strategies as their proposal and approach aligned what the CBSA was looking for, particularly rapid staff augmentation. The Deloitte proposal was a managed service using their cloud instance. This would have involved additional risk and did not align with our decision to build 
cloud mob competencies with the agencies. Are you prepared right here and right now, sir, Mr. Moore, to confirm once and for all that it was Mindone who ultimately made the decision to go with GC Strategies, yes or no? Um, so I'd like to provide some additional clarification for the committee. So there were two decisions here. The first decision was how the, the ArriveCan um, app would be developed. That decision was a staff augmentation decision. The decision was to keep this in-house in order to develop the app and use staff augmentation to bring in the technical services required. The other option was the managed service approach, which is the Deloitte option. It was decided at that time by the executive committee um, that the managed services option would not be appropriate because it was unclear what the statement of work would be from the Public Health Agency of Canada. Sir, we, we, this is all evidence we've already heard. I don't need you to waste valuable time that I have to repeat that. I'm sure you've been following the committee and you know what the evidence has already led. Will you confirm with me right now at this point in time that Min Doan was charged with the responsibility of choosing Government of Canada strategies? So I can confirm once the staff augmentation model was agreed, um, the ISTB was responsible, branch was responsible for putting in place the resources required, whether those be resources from... And was that Mindon, sir, yes or no? Was that no, Mindon? was the vice president of the inf inf Information <laughs> Science and Technology. Was branch. that Mindon, sir, yes he or no? He won't say it. President, and it was a decision made by... And the, the vice president at that time was Mindon, correct? correct. Why ah, do you have a difficult time saying that? There it that? is! Because he is the vice president. Right. All so, the documentation okay. has been signed. End of discussion. Him. You've now confirmed, as many people have confirmed, that it was Min Doan. Min Doan repeatedly lied to this committee, saying he didn't personally make that decision. His team did. So I'm very glad for your honesty, and we can clarify that and move on. But I think now this was, sir. I asked the questions. This was such a political hot potato for the government that the Minister of Public Safety at the time, Marco Mendicino, had significant concerns with Government of Canada strategies, particularly with the millions of dollars received. And we now know that they receive upwards to $19 million for their involvement uh, in this particular uh, boondoggle. Now, we know that Mr. McDonald, Cameron McDonald, was threatened by Min Doan on October 28, 2022. There was a phone call. He was told that the public safety minister at the time, Marco Mendocino, was unhappy with the Arrive Can media coverage and wanted someone's head on a platter. He was worried that either he or you, sir, Jonathan Moore, were going to get fired. So he was talking about someone's head on a platter. There you have it. He finally said it. Min Doan. Now, this just kind of really confirms what I was, you know, I first stated about a month and a half ago when this all this scandal broke out. Maybe it was two months ago. They were working on the inside and they're working on the outside. Christian Firth was the delivery mechanism to get the money out of the government. And it really seems Min Doan was the kingpin. Obviously, if he's threatened those other guys, they were in on it too. I think that that twenty million dollars that uh, Christian Firth took on the, the arrive can, it was, they were, they probably split it so they each get whatever three million each or whatever it is. And who knows if Aaron O'Gorman or some of these other people are involved? But probably Cameron McDonald, the Tony, Tony Utano, uh, obviously Min Doan, Christian Firth. Oh, that's that sleaze ball. Uh, what's his name? Anthony uh, Darren Anthony. That guy is like the biggest sleaze ball out of all of those guys. He's more sleazy than uh, Christian Firth. It's not a cottage, it's a chalet. <laughs> I hope they get the paddy wagon ready and just give them their own jumpsuits and toss their butts in jail, all of them. But sadly, that's probably not how things are going to go. Knowing the government, they'll probably give them a raise and a golden pension and <laughs> that kind of treatment. Wrapping up this video here, we've got some more protesting going on in Ottawa. This is of the uh, pro-Canadian variety of protesting. And we'll end this episode with some uh, memes here on my group. Uh, so, Canada, help us. We're starving. The best I can do is tampons in the men's room. <laughs> it's funny because it's true. It really is. Like, forget Jake Paul. Can we have this matchup, please? You're welcome. <laughs>
<laughs> I would pay money to see Tyson fight Trudeau. <laughs> Driver's putting $50 in their car today. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. How to get the most of your... <laughs> How to get the most of your cast iron frying pan. <laughs> Follow me for more kitchen tips. <laughs> Batman, I think we just ran over Justin Trudeau. Well, Robin, we are crime fighters. <laughs> Who makes these things? <laughs> oh, God. Okay, that's where we're going to end this episode. So let me know in the comments down below what you guys are thinking about uh, Jordan Peterson's remarks there on climate change, the carbon pricing, the carbon tax, all that kind of stuff. It is really, it just seems very nefarious. And all we can do is laugh our way through it with uh, silly memes like that, that just seem to be endless. <laughs> it seems to be snowballing in that group as <laughs> more and more memes are popping up every single day. I've never seen any of these memes. I don't know who's making them, but they're great. Thanks for watching to the end of the video here. Be sure to subscribe. If you want to check out my other channel, Moose on the Loose Extra, I put up extra content there that sometimes it's not national content. It's more localized. Um, sometimes I just don't know if it's stuff you guys want to see or not. So I just put up there, test it out as well as testing different formats and different, different stuff. It's linked up there. And I think I'm going to change the logo a bit just so it's very more distinct. You guys know which is the main one and which is the extra one. But regardless, be sure to subscribe here. Turn on the notifications. Stay warm, stay fed. I'll see you guys in the next one.